Have you ever wondered how you can get away from your mind being so rigid with certain ideas that you can't seem to get ahead? How can you be more flexible and give yourself more options? That's what we'll talk about today. Those who don't move don't notice their chains. Rosa Luxemburg. Today, we're going to talk about the book, A Liberated Mind, How to Pivot Towards What Matters by Stephen C. Hayes, PhD. In this particular book, he's talking about a certain skill level that will help us be flexible and more open and more accepting of different directions in our lives. I talked about last week about how we're trying to convince ourselves to do things. But in this particular case, we're trying to convince our rigidity to not be so rigid. Sometimes we come up with certain rules for ourselves or certain ways that we think our life should be. And because of that psychological rigidity, we're avoiding negative thoughts. We're avoiding negative feelings. We're protecting ourselves from things that we think may happen. And sometimes that's the very thing that's holding us back from doing what we really want to do. If I start this new business, people will be against me, or I'll be worried about where I'm getting paid all the time, or I like to think of myself as a good person. Will I still be a good person if I do this new thing? So sometimes being rigid can be useful. It can give us a wall to lean against when we're struggling to make things work. But at other times, it can actually act as a barrier towards any pain we're feeling, any fears that we're having, preventing us from getting the things we actually want. By having more flexibility in our psychology, this will allow us to start accepting some of our aspirations and things that we really hope to do. We talked about the aspect before that negativity in our lives is much more powerful to us than positivity. If we hear a bad phrase said about us, or we have a bad thought about ourselves, it is harder to overcome than when someone says a good thing about us or something positive about us. We end up taking that negative statement or emotion much harder than we take a positive thing that was about us today. And so what we're trying to do is actually avoid any kind of intolerance that we have in our own system, become more flexible so that we can have less anxiety about the situation, that we can actually start looking at the things that would really make us happy or succeed in the things that we're trying to succeed and be better about it. He says, too, that rigidity makes it harder for us to learn from our emotions. That's a direct quote, because if we're always trying to avoid anything negative, then it's going to give us a blind spot about what it is that's really going on. That if we have certain fears or we have certain emotions when it comes to things in our lives, if we won't look at it, we won't talk about it, we won't think about it because we built up a wall against it, we'll actually never be able to solve it. It will always be there tormenting us without us getting any sort of result about it, without getting any sort of progress in it. And he said that studies show that if you don't understand the emotions that you're having, whether coming in your family or with yourself, you'll never learn about those things and you'll never be able to solve them because you just keep avoiding the same thing over and over again. He says that we're paying a price because there's nothing wrong with treating the problems we have in our lives as something to be solved. If we just put them in this box and say, I won't go there, I won't touch it, I won't look at it. We can't solve it. Instead, when we look at our problems, whether they're emotional, have a long history with us as something we can solve, then we'll be able to start working to eliminate that pain, to take on that fear, and we'll be able to actually work on it. He says it makes sense that when we put our hands on a stove or we cut ourselves with a knife, we immediately retract and pull our hand away from it and we don't put our hand back on the stove. But we're doing that with everything. We're doing that with the emotional things in our lives. And that's a different situation. We're meant to solve other problems in our lives. And instead, what we do is we do what he calls self-soothing, where we basically don't think about it. We avoid it. We look at other activities we do. Maybe we play games so that we're not paying attention to the problems in our lives. 
It's helping us to avoid those situations so we never have to fix them because, oh, I'm doing this over here right now. I'm reading this great book. I'm really enjoying this book. But when I'm done with the book, I'm totally going to think about this particular issue. I'm going to solve my problem or I'm going to get a new job or I'm going to do something that I need to do. But we never get there. We never actually address those issues because we are basically self-medicating with our hobbies, with our enjoyment in the world, or maybe with actual medication instead of just trying to fix them. And he says we pay a high price for that because we never get to where we want to be. And so his goal in trying to liberate ourselves from these rigid traps that we've set for ourselves, and maybe the rigid traps look lovely because they're reading a favorite book, they're listening to wonderful music, taking a hot bath, which we all need to do at times. But if we're doing them all the time because we're building up a wall against what's really making us unhappy, it's going to cause us to never be happy. And he says that's the problem with a lot of self-help books is that they will try to get you away from the thing that you're actually getting distress from. How can you take a hot bath, listen to music and diffuse a situation? And he's saying by those books telling us to just gain peace by doing other things, we're actually preventing ourselves from just fixing the situation altogether. And he says that it's experiential avoidance, which we try to run away from what it is we're doing with other experiences, feelings, and emotion. And he says instead what we need to do is actually have acceptance towards our problems, towards our emotions, towards the negative things that we're trying to build a wall against. Because once we do, that's inviting those things to come along with us, to be part of the solutions to the things that we're having, and creates a flexible situation for us where we can take those things and help us pivot into the new thing that we're going to do. And that being in the present, being right here, right now, and going after those things will help us move on instead of being constantly in mindless distraction, mindless getting away from our problems. So he said in the end, action, that we have to act in order to pivot away from those negative things, those walls that we've put up, and pivot towards something that we're able to actually move towards. He said that the process of pivoting is building habits and what he calls small steps. You know, I like small steps, so I, of course, like that situation. And constructing bigger habits of trying to care for ourselves, but actually in a way that goes after those problems in a very intentional way. So first of all, we have to put some attention towards it. We have to be able to see our thoughts clearly so that we can figure out what we need to do next. And that we also have to know how we'll be willing to act regardless of all the things our brain is screaming about. Because again, it's just like pulling off a Band-Aid. As soon as you pull a Band-Aid off, it hurts. And so same thing here is that once you start addressing the problems you actually have, the psychological issues that you've built a wall around, your brain is going to complain. It's going to go, ow, and it's going to yell and it's going to scream. Once you pull off that mental Band-Aid, can you start seeing the attention, the thoughts, and give it enough distance, maybe what we talked about last week, that balcony view, so that you can actually get around it. And then he says that you have to notice whatever stories you've constructed around that and gain some perspective of it. So if you ever had a fear that you didn't want to do something, maybe you didn't want to get on an airplane, and so then you told yourself, well, I don't need to get on an airplane. I don't need to go anywhere because I like it here. Now you've built a story around it so that you never have to address exactly what it is your fear is. But if we can have that longer view of it, find out exactly what it is we're really afraid of, then we can start to address those particular issues and allow yourself to feel those feelings. I mentioned that when I first took my job, I was afraid of flying. And I had told myself, well, I don't have the money to fly anyway, so it doesn't really matter that I'm afraid of flying because I can't go anywhere even if I wasn't afraid. And so I just allowed myself to feel that way. When I was actually on the airplane itself, I knit a hat, I listened to music, I read a book. So I did try to do some things initially on the plane to distract myself. 
but I also listened to myself. I let myself feel afraid. That way I could get through it. I could get past it. And so it's an important aspect to let yourself feel the feelings that you're having. And then you want to be able to figure out what it is you need to get past those emotions. Because I don't want to just be afraid of flying. I want to get over my fear of flying. And so maybe if I just read books and knit things and pretended I wasn't on an airplane, I could get to my destination and it would be okay. But my goal was to stop being afraid of flying, not just to pacify myself and still be afraid of flying, but just happier about it. So trying to get over those situations with smaller habits is going to help you feel better about it. And he says that those types of pivots will help you as a cheat sheet, know what to go through and do in order to give yourself some distance, see what you need to do next, hear what your brain is chattering about so that you can start addressing them in some very specific ways. And that when we know what the actual goals are and we start choosing either behaviors or thoughts that you want to have instead of the ones that you're having. So if you're afraid of getting a new job or you're afraid of flying on an airplane and you've built these walls around them, what can you do to break through those walls, become more flexible about it and start moving in the direction you want? So now when I fly, I'm not afraid of flying at all. It doesn't even cross my mind. And that made it all better because now I've been able to fly to Hawaii. I've been able to fly to England. I've been able to fly to India. And those are some big flights. And I was never afraid. And had I been not addressing my fears and not coming into negotiated habits with myself so that I could get over those fears, I could certainly distract myself with knitting and listening to podcasts and reading books while on an airplane, but not for the 16 hours it took me to get to India. So without actually getting over it, it would have been a very hard road for me. And so that's the same thing too. Can you lull yourself out of not being afraid of whatever it is you're afraid of, maybe getting a new job, but that's not the goal. Your goal is so that you actually have the fortitude to get a job when you need to get a job or do something when you need to do it and not just pacify yourself to get by this particular roadblock that you have right now. That in the end will give you the happiness that you're looking for. And you have to realize, too, that your problems, other people's problems, are not going to get fixed that quickly, that lives aren't smooth. Sometimes you'll have setbacks. Sometimes you'll do well. But the idea is that you're making these small steps, these small corrections in your life so that you can actually do what you're looking to do. Some days will be better than other days. But when you realize that you're actually making progress towards your goals, whatever your goal is, and overcoming those walls and fears that you've been doing, that's when you're going to find success in it. He says that our brains are avoiders and that we're always looking for that awful situation to happen again. And so we're paying attention to whatever negative thing we think is going to happen. So if you're afraid of dating and you suspect that the person will always leave you, Whenever you ask someone on a date, they're always going to dump you. They're always going to leave you. And so you're always looking out for that key moment where that person starts doing it. And you may trash that relationship because you maybe see it happening. I remember once I went on a date with someone and I was, of course, very obsessed with not dating someone who drank a lot. And I actually went on a date with someone where he didn't actually drink a lot. He doesn't drink a lot. But you know what? He had three drinks on our first night. And suddenly all the warning signals were going up in my brain. Uh Uh-oh, why is he drinking so much? Boy, that's his third drink. Why is he drinking like that? I had to calm my brain. You don't know why he's drinking three drinks. You know, maybe he just loves this restaurant and that's what he loves to do. Maybe it's a warning sign, but it may not be. But boy, I had to get my brain out of this situation because all I could do was count how many drinks he was having. So again, you'll have to calm yourself down. Some days will be better than others. And then later when I got to know him better, I found out he does not drink that often. He has a drink here and there, but that night he probably had a little bit more than he usually has, maybe because he was nervous. Don't let your brain, which is going to look for every time that negative thing is going to happen, 
run away with you. Because if you do, it's going to be harder for you to overcome those issues. But your brain, it loves to avoid pain. So it's going to try to do it every time it can. So you're trying to overcome inflexibility. So the first of them is what he calls the confirmation effect. And that's when you get an experience that confirms your suspicion. That inflexibility is actually going to lead you astray. So again, I could have just gone on that date with that guy, saw how much he drank the furry first date, not taking into account that maybe he was nervous, and written him off. No, I can't date him. He had three drinks on our first date. You know, that's very inflexible. And it was the wrong opinion. So getting rid of those situations where we confirm the very thing that we're looking for is important. Then the second one he calls the coherence effect. So that's when our brain takes something that's pretty complicated and boils it all down to exactly explaining what it is we expected to see. And it may be somewhat related to what you wanted to see. So for example, on my first flight, we hit a really bumpy patch. Well, here it is. This is the part where we're going to die. And I could have had all my fears go out it. And I boiled a particular complicated situation, air turbulence, a bumpy ride, all those types of things, and boiled it into the fact that, yep, I was right to be afraid of flying. Look how awful this is. It's a complicated situation. So don't allow your brain to take something that's complicated and just have it make you inflexible to what you're trying to do. And then the last effect, he said, is called the compliance effect. And that means that we try to follow rules in general to um, kind of gain social and mental acceptance. You know, yay, I did the thing I was supposed to do. And by being in compliance, it can actually cause us to be less flexible. So if you're thinking about getting a job and you're afraid to get a job, And you decide that you're going to be compliant and just do a good job at the job you're at. It's exactly what you need to do. You'll just work harder. Maybe you'll actually convince yourself that you don't need to go get a new job because you're just going to be compliant. You're just going to do the thing that's expected of you and not go out there. And by doing that, it's causing you to avoid the thing that's going to actually make you happier or get you closer to your dreams instead of actually allowing you to break free of it. So those are the three C's. He says we have to avoid them. And by avoiding them, it will allow us to be more flexible and progress better in our lives. We have to realize that whether it's because of the three C's or other reasons, whenever we're inflexible or avoiding something, not getting a new job, not going on the airplane ride, we're basically giving up. And we're allowing whatever that fear or that wall is telling us is out there, we're allowing it to win. And so that's where we're going to basically end our path. We're going to end the thing that we're really hoping to do right then and there because we have decided to avoid the situation primarily because we're not being flexible or we're not seeing the bigger picture. He gave a very interesting analogy when it came to his own life. He sort of imagined that he was in this gigantic tug of war with maybe a monster and anxiety and fear and whatever's going to go wrong in this situation is on the other side of the rope. And somehow you've built it in your head that you have to win this war with anxiety, pull anxiety over the cliff with your rope in order to actually get the things you want to do. And he said, you know what? No one has ever told you that you have to win your war with anxiety before you get the things you want in life. You can just drop the rope. You don't have to play this game. You don't have to try to battle your fears or battle your anxiety. You can just decide you're going to do the thing you need to do. Nobody is asking you to play tug of war. You're asking yourself to play tug of war. And once you drop the rope, Now your hands and your arms are free to actually do more interesting things in his analogy. And I really like that. He talks next about how where you're trying to basically label your emotions. It's not just a matter of acknowledging those emotions there, but it's really focusing in on changing them. How can you go about and take your fear and turn it into excitement? I'm afraid to get a new job. I'm afraid to go on the airplane and instead turn it around so that you're ready to do the thing you need to do so that you can not avoid the issue 
be mentally somewhere else, try to avoid the situation, but actually take what you're doing and turn it around so that it works for you. And he said a lot of that has to do with basically noticing your tendencies, giving yourself a little bit of grace, some compassion, patting yourself on the back, and trying to let go of the habits that just make it worse. So if you're avoiding looking for a new job by reading a lot of really good books, oh, I'll just read this next book or not going on a diet. Well, if I just read this other book that told me how I could eat better, then I'll go on a diet. Whatever it is that is your common behavior, stamp it out because those are the things that you're doing to avoid your problem. And even though you're going to listen to yourself compassionately, you want to make sure that you do act and that you do start moving in the direction away from it and that you want to basically stop running from the pain, essentially. Start taking on those things. I mean, certainly it's hard to take on fears and emotions. But when you start with it in little tiny steps, so for example, if you were looking to get a new job and you're too afraid to get a new job, maybe you just one day write an outline for a resume. Then the next week, you clean it up a little bit. You make it a little bit more firm. You maybe talk to someone and ask them to look at it. But you do it in these small steps. I'm still afraid. I'm still afraid of getting a new job. But I'm going to take on these little tiny challenges, make it smaller so that the pain basically doesn't come right at you. Hey, I'm not getting a new job today. All I'm doing is writing a resume because as soon as you have the resume, now you feel like you can use it. Or as soon as you say, well, you know what I'm going to do? Every day, I'm just going to look at 10 jobs on a website that posts jobs. Not going to take them, just going to look at them, see what's available. But as you start addressing these fears and little tiny steps about it, It'll get easier for you to do the next time and it'll be easier for you to do something about it. So he said the best thing we can do at this point is come up with a little tiny plan, break them up into tiny thoughts, acknowledge the fact that we're feeling emotions towards them and start doing them in little tiny ways that avoid those immediate pain triggers. The better we get at them, the more we start doing the little tiny steps, the bigger steps we'll be able to take in the future and we'll be able to address those problems. So my challenge to you is to try to think of one thing that you've been putting a wall against, putting a box against, because it's either something that's scary to you, painful to you, and start listening to yourself. Exactly what's going on with that particular item. If you're afraid of something, why are you afraid of it? What do you think is going to be the thing that happens to you if you were to tackle it? And how can you talk about that thing to yourself so that you realize that there is no big downside to it? Or are there little tiny steps that you could take towards it where you could move towards that direction and ease your fears so that you can see, wow, nothing happened bad when I wrote a resume or nothing happened bad when I got in an airplane. That was okay. I did all right. But just try figuring out one fear and see if you can do a deep dive into what's really going on. And today's fun entertainment advice comes from Breaking Bad. I have spent my whole life scared. Frightened of things that could happen. Might happen, might not happen. 50 years I spent like that. Finding myself awake at three in the morning. But you know what? Ever since my diagnosis, I sleep just fine. I came to realize it's that fear that's the worst of it. That's the real enemy. So, get up get out in the real world and you kick them well the next sentence has a bad word so i cut it off because we got a clean record here but he wants to kick fear in the teeth and you should kick fear in the teeth maybe not do the things that walt did on breaking bad but you know what i mean do good things all right everyone thanks so much i hope you have a wonderful week and don't forget to please leave a review subscribe to the podcast and tell a friend Again, I'm trying to have a podcasting empire, so if you could do those things, it would help a lot. 
Thanks very much. <laughs>